Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next presentation. I have been joined by Paulo Russo and uh, Jen English, who work at the Natural History Museum in London. Paulo and Jen are going to introduce us to the rather different, but both visually stunning Turing exhibitions today. So Jurassic Oceans and Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Paulo, how are you? And you, Jen? I'm very, I'm very well, thanks. Thanks a lot for having us here today. Hi, Raquel. Hi, Jen. Good, so I know you have brought a whole team of speakers with you, so I won't take more of your stage time and leave you to it. <clears throat> See you later at the end of the session. Many thanks, Raquel. See you later, bye. bye. So hello, everybody. Uh, many thanks for joining us today. We are delighted to have you here. And many thanks to Excite, of course, for organizing this special business, business day. I am Paolo Russo, Exhibition Partnerships Manager at the National History Museum in London, and I have the pleasure of being your host for the next 30 minutes with Jan English, our head of touring exhibitions. Hello, good afternoon, Jan. How are you today? Yes, hi, Paolo. I'm great, thanks. Really excited to be here today. <laughs> Many thanks, Jan. So uh, now let's talk about the next 30 minutes. I would like to quickly give you an idea of what you can expect from this session and how we have um, organized it and structured it. We will focus on two traveling exhibitions from our portfolio. The first 13 minutes will cover Jurassic Ocean's Monsters of the Deep a new show which we launch at the Film Museum in Chicago later this year. And I will present this part of the session, while the second half of the session will focus on the internationally acclaimed Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition. And Jan will have the pleasure to talk to you about that. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A chat button throughout the session. Uh, so let's jump into the first exhibition now, Jurassic Oceans. Let's have a look at a trailer we've put together for you. Could you please all click on the green button below? You should be able to see now, thank you. And don't forget to come back to Crowdcast when the video is over, I'll be here waiting for you. Thanks again and see you in a minute. So uh, Jurassic Oceans, Monsters of the Deep, uh, if you have ever wondered uh, what was happening in the oceans when the dinosaurs were roaming the land, well, this is the right exhibition for you. Uh, the main aim of the show really is to give family audiences the opportunity to dive into this uh, adventurous and mysterious underwater world and discover with fun, of course, uh, some of the most incredible creatures that have ever lived on this planet. Some, of course, were quite gigantic and scary. Uh, now, I would just like to briefly show you some pages from our new digital brochure and highlight some of the most important features of Jurassic Oceans. Uh, first, the look and feel. Everything was designed so as to bring Jurassic creatures back to life in an underwater environment. Uh, the exhibition look and feel was created by the team at the Film Museum in Chicago in partnership with us at the NHM. And uh, all set works, display cases, and AV equipment will be included in the touring package. So the show is fully turnkey and is designed to fit between 650 and 1,000 square meters. Uh, key fossil specimens, uh, as we said, the exhibition was developed by the NHM and includes some of the rarest and most remarkable specimens from its collection, including fully articulated fossil skeletons of marine reptiles, the huge three meters long tail of the largest known Jurassic fish, and some striking casts such as the Dorodon you are seeing right here on the slide, 
and the long-necked plesiosaur, one of the most emblematic reptiles of the Jurassic Seas. Um, as we mentioned in the trailer, uh, we have just seen, the worm shallow seas of the Jurassic will come to life through a state-of-the-art CGI, atmospheric soundscapes and lighting, projections, and hands-on interactives created with the help of our expert scientists here at the NHM. Visitors will really have the chance to come face to face uh, with fearsome ancient predators and uh, the curious looking prey like never uh, before. Um, and finally, we have included in the exhibition package material to help venues develop their educational programs, of course. So, and on this note, now let me just stop sharing the, the screen. Here we are. I hope you can see me now. So, um, and on this note, we are very lucky today, as we have here with us uh, Dr. Aubrey Roberts, uh, an expert on marine reptiles from the time of the dinosaurs, and a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oslo Natural History Museum. She's also affiliated with the London Natural History Museum as a scientific associate researcher. Hi, Aubrey. Thanks a lot uh, for joining uh, us today. Hi, I'm very well here, Paolo, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and able to speak about Jurassic Oceans. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, so you basically, you spent quite a lot of time working on the educational material and the CGA films that were developed for Jurassic Oceans. Yes, Paolo. I was a scientific advisor on the project as I'm a specialist on ancient marine reptiles. I work continuously with the exhibition team to help add up-to-date science to part of the exhibit and educational materials. So over the course of the year working with the team, it was amazing seeing my conversations with the team included in all the exhibition materials. It would be great to uh, focus with you first on the CJ films. Uh, the main question is, how can prehistoric animals be shown on screen? Thanks, Paola. So whilst state-of-the-art CGI, of course, is one of the answers, and when the CGI films are produced at every stage, a group of scientists advise the CGI team on the latest science to create the creatures with the most accurate shapes and features, movement, skin texture, and this is to make the virtual animals appear more lifelike. Right. So there was a lot of research going into the movement of the Lyopleridans flippers, I know, for example, and the articulation of the plesiosaur. Perhaps you could tell us something about this? So one of the challenges is that we don't have Lyopleridans swimming around today, thank goodness, or anything similar to compare with. Um, these are massive underwater predators which used four flippers to propel themselves through water, a feat that not even modern sea turtles come close to. So did all four flippers move together or were they out of sync? These are questions that we need to use science to answer, as all we have left of these amazing prehistoric animals are bones. For this, we base the CGI movement off some top-notch research using robotic plesiosaurs to find out the most efficient way of moving through water, as right. well as looking at the general constraints of the skeleton. Fantastic. So we can actually show some images of the CJ films you work on, Aubrey, right? Yes, let's have a look at them together. Fantastic. Well, then, just a second, please bear with me while I share my screen. Right. Fantastic. So uh, this is one, an image from one of the digital interactives, uh, which are part of the exhibition. And this is a La uh, right, uh, Aubrey? Yes, so Lyopleridon was one of the top predators of the Jurassic Seas, and here you can see its flippers are moving out of sync based off the research, so front flipper down, hind flipper up, which is the most energy efficient way of moving. Also, the flippers are quite stiff and not bendy looking at the skeleton, so these are just some of the things that I input into that. I see. Um, skin texture of these ancient marine reptiles was probably one of the most difficult uh, features to recreate, wasn't it? Let's have a look at another image while we talk about this. Yes, so that was very challenging. We spent a lot of time studying skin texture and fat in marine reptiles. As you know, marine mammals have a layer of blubber for insulation. Turns out marine reptiles, or at least some of them, had that as well. And this research was published while the exhibition was being designed, and we also included this into the exhibit. I see. And uh, what about the skin colors? So yeah, the skin colors. Uh, these were based off the coloration of the specimen um, 
or specimens that have been determined by fossil pigments, as well as the fact that marine predators often use counter shading, so light colors on the belly, dark colors on top for camouflage in water, as you can see here. Oh, that's so interesting, Aubrey. Thanks so much. Just a second that I'll stop sharing my screen and I will be back with you. Right. So again, thanks so much for all these precious insights. Uh, this is also um, fascinating, really. And uh, so I was wondering if you could also tell us something about the educational material you mentioned. Uh, you said you, uh, you contributed to the creation of the Jurassic Adventure Guide and the fossil discovery workshop that come with the exhibition. How did they work? Well, through my meetings with the representatives from the exhibition team, we discussed interesting facts backed up by science about the animals in Jurassic Oceans. Together, we picked out, out the facts represented in the educational tools. These were designed to be key features of the animals that were interesting, that could be recognized in the fossils and have parallels drawn to modern animals today. That is really fantastic, Aubrey. Thanks again for joining us today. It was really great to hear about the, the making of Jurassic Oceans. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a fantastic experience working with the exhibition team. Bye, Aubrey. Thanks again. Um, Following up on what we had just said, I would just like to remind uh, everybody that we have developed an educational film, which is part of the exhibition package. And you can see a very nice trailer of this film on our Excite Online webpage. Please do go and check it out after the session. So now let's shift our attention to another fantastic exhibition developed by the NHM, Wildlife Photographer of the Year. I will hand over the screen to Jan now. Hi, Jan. Hi, Paolo. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about Wildlife Photographer of the Year today, and I'm going to call to the screen my colleague, um, Soraya um, Salvador. Soraya looks after Wildlife Photographer of the Year at Natural History Museum. Um, so, Soraya, please join us. Just wait a minute while uh, Soraya joins us on the screen. She'll be here very soon. Hello. Hi, Soraya. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, Soraya, can you tell everyone about Wildlife Photographer of the Year? I think many people have heard about it, but what exactly is it? Yes, sure. So, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, or WPY as we call it internally at the Natural History Museum, it's the largest uh, wildlife photography competition in the world. So, in 2020, we are celebrating our 56th edition, which is fantastic. Uh, it is a very global competition that is open to everyone, both amateur, professional photographers, adults, children, from literally every corner of the world. So just to explain what I mean by this, last year we reached nearly 50,000 entries from 86 countries around the world, which is incredible. And this competition, uh, it celebrates the beauty, the drama, the diversity of wildlife and nature on the planet. And you can see that on the wide range of categories that we have that span from animal portraits, behaviors, flora. And then we have the uh, groundbreaking photojournalism stories where we talk about the human impact on the planet. Uh, I have to say that my favorite categories are always the young ones, the young wildlife photographer of the year that celebrates young practitioners age 17 and under. So you mentioned it's a competition. Can you talk to us about the judging process? How does that actually work, Soraya? Yes, sure. So every year we we created a, um, we invite an independent judging panel that is composed by professional photographers, picture editors, people that have been working for a long time in the industry. So they come together and uh, in two rounds they sift through those fifty thousand, almost fifty thousand entries, and they select the best one hundred finalist image images. And with these ones, we create the exhibition wildlife photographer of the year that, that then opens in London and tours around the world. So how do you actually announce the winners? Oh yes, the, the announcement. So uh, we organize every year in October a very special celebrated celebration, which is the award ceremony, where all the photographers that are in the competition, they come together. We announce the overall uh, uh, Wildlife Talk of the Year, which is a very respected uh, you know, prize. And you also have the overall Young Wildlife Talk of the Year. And uh, this is a really special moment. And, um, and once we have the award ceremony, then uh, the exhibition opens in London and tours around the world. I think for us, this, this competition is all about uh, inspiring visitors uh, to protect and preserve nature and to question our presence on the planet. And for us, I, I always say that images speak louder than words, and this is a cliche. Photography is a very accessible medium, but we really hope that these images spark conversations in communities about environmental issues. 
Thanks, Raya. And I think, yeah, that's right. The competition becomes this global exhibition, as you mentioned, that opens in London, but it also opens on tour in October every year as well. And it tours for 16 months across the globe. Um, and last year, the exhibition toured to 39 venues, 12 countries on four continents and was seen by over 2 million visitors. It's really one of our most popular exhibitions in London, but also around the world. There's so many loyal and repeat visitors that come back every single year with family and friends. They really look forward it's to true. seeing the exhibition each year. So it's amazing. Um, so I'd like to share with you some exhibition um, photos from around the world. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. So Wildlife Talk for the year, um, so share with you some exciting images. So this one was the grand title winner of the 2019 competition. So it's the current exhibition and it's just an amazing photo. And as you said, Soraya, you know, there's so much storytelling behind these images and each of them kind of sparks such an interesting story and they're beautiful as well. Um, this is another photo. This one was also from the current exhibition from 2019, the current exhibition on tour. So it was one of the um, category winners. And then we had the grand title winner here um, from last year's exhibition, which is again, just a gorgeous photo. And then the grand title winner from the 2015 exhibition. And I think what's amazing about these photos for me is they're all very different and beautiful in their own right. So you mentioned Soraya, the award ceremony. So it is very much an exciting event, as you said, for us. So here is um, the grand title winner receiving his prize in 2019 last year for the photo that um, we just showed you. Um, it's an event that brings people, all the photography community from around the world, but kind of really exciting event for us in London, a really celebration for the year. And it brings in some really high profile people as well. So here we have the Duchess of Cambridge at the Wildlife Photography of the Year 50th Award handing out the grand title prize, as well as Sir David Attenborough at the um, Wildlife Photography of the Year 50th Award. And so I think it just shows the importance of the exhibition to not only the photography for community, visitors, but also from very high profile people that are very much understanding the importance of the exhibition and the messages it can really tell on communities around the world. So the exhibition itself, so um, this is a photo of the exhibition as it's displayed in London at the Natural History Museum, so you can just get a sense of how it looks in our gallery. And on the touring version, we actually offer two formats on tour. So we have the dye bonds, which is a photography printed um, onto an aluminum backed panel, which is the photo you see to the left of your screen. And on the right, we have the light panel version, which we also tour. So that is the same um, version that you saw in the Natural History Museum Gallery. And then just some examples of the exhibition as it looks in other locations. So this was the exhibition last year at the Field Museum in Chicago, in China. This is in Auckland, New Zealand. We were in um, Toronto, Canada as well. And then this is the dive on version on display. This is Bristol in the United Kingdom, the exhibition in Germany. Um, and then here again in Australia, we have the um, Australian National Maritime Museum. And just some of the kind of key highlights. So I think for us, which is really exciting is this opportunity to be able to bring the world to your visitors. And I think this is particularly important at this time when people aren't able to travel very easily. So it's just something really exciting about being able to still kind of open up the world. It's very easy to install and set up. It doesn't require any teams traveling, so it makes itself quite easy at this point in time to still move around. And it's also good for social distancing. So there's no interactives. You can really come and enjoy an experience um, and, and you don't have to worry about um, whether or not you know, interactivities or that sort of thing can, can be touched. You can really just enjoy the experience. Um, we mentioned it's popular with a range of audiences. So really young adults love it, family audiences, and also adults on their own. Um, and we offer a range of product, um, retail products that are also very popular as part of the exhibition. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to talk a bit more about Sarai, which you touched on earlier, is this idea of the images that are really sparking a reaction. And so I'm gonna call to the screen to join um, Sarai and myself, Brad Irwin, my colleague at the Natural History Museum. So we'll just wait for Brad to join. So Brad is our head of international partnerships at the museum. And I know he's been very active at Excite, um, having done a lot of presentations last week during the other sessions. So we're excited to be able to have Brad with us here today with Sarai and myself. Hi, Brad. Hey, Jan. Very happy to see you again. Um, so Brad, <laughs> tell us about your role at NHM and, and why it's so important. Um, thanks so much for inviting me. It's, it's kind of great to be back on the, the virtual Excite stage. Um, so maybe I should start by saying that the museum launched a new strategy last year with a vision for a world where people and planet thrive. 
and a mission to create advocates for the planet. So my job is pretty, pretty special. Um, I get to take that mission and think about the museum's work as both a, a sort of a cultural organization and a scientific institution and partner with other museums, governments, corporations around the world to really amplify that thinking. So in many ways, WPY makes my working life super easy because as you all know, it's this big global competition that reflects the natural world. Uh, but for me, the big difference is I tend to not think about the competition and the exhibition as much as you guys do, but I tend to think more about the photographers and the images and how we can make, um, how we can use them to have different conversations about the state of the planet today. Um, so what I want to do is use those incredible assets to spark conversations, change behaviors on an individual level, all the way up to sort of decision makers and international organizations. So Brad, you and Soraya have been bringing content from wildlife photography for the year to the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos for the past few years. So could you tell us more about that? Yeah, so maybe I should start by saying that the Forum's annual meeting in Davos is this kind of surreal moment in time every year where the world's political, social and commercial leaders come to this beautiful snowy town in Switzerland in order to set the sort of global agenda for the forthcoming year. And the great thing about the forum is they want to tackle these global issues, not just in bilateral discussions or keynote speeches. They also want to create a really vibrant arts program to sort of examine these issues, but through a different lens. So working with the team at the forum, we've taken WPY now for two years in a kind of completely new format as a way to explore the beauty and fragility of the natural world. And as you know, some of those images are beautiful, some are massively tragic, and some sort of uh, show signs of hope. So they're all in there to kind of spark dialogue and discussion with those, with those world leaders. Thanks, Brad. I can imagine it just must be completely surreal to be there and amazing that wildlife photography gets to be featured so prominently. And I absolutely love seeing it displayed in such a different way too, in such a different forum. Um, Jan, it is pretty much the, the weirdest working uh, week of my life. <laughs> um, and this will sound really, really cheesy, but it also makes me feel sort of incredibly proud that the museum and these images can kind of get into these kind of circles and actually have kind of intense conversations about the state of the planet, which is exactly what we, what we should be doing. I should also say that we have not just taken pictures to Davos, we've uh, also worked with the forum to take our young wildlife photographer of the year winners and give them a platform to talk to that audience about why they love wildlife photography and how taking these images can have an effect on people's behavior. So in 2019, we took an incredibly young Sky Mika uh, who was in conversation with Jane Goodall talking all about big cats and their plight and uh, this year we took Cruz Erdman, uh, who was in conversation with Sylvia Earle, uh, all about the, the state of, of our oceans. And I think what's really cool about these young winners is their voice completely cuts through the crowd. And we've all seen the power of Greta Thunberg. Uh, and there's just something really, really quite special about their honesty, their fearlessness. And so for me, it's this kind of great, powerful and meaningful opportunity to get them into those events. Yeah, and I, I would like to compliment what Brad is saying. It's it's really important for us to take these images um, to these uh, international forums and international platforms with decision makers. Uh, it's not about just showcasing beautiful images. It's really trying to create some impact. And you know, I again, as I said before, images can change the world. And there were a couple of instances in the previous competitions where actually images had uh, they changed something. And I want just to give example of two th two, two times that happened. Uh, the first one is this fantastic image uh, from Indonesia from a Spanish photographer Juan de la Malla. He he it, he, he made this really tragic and sad uh, portrait of the, of this monkey of a dancing monkey in the streets of Jakarta. And once this picture was released. Easy. you know it was um, it was presented on the on the um, in newspapers in Indonesia and it actually sparked a conversation in society about the exploitation of these animals and why these practices are, are still so present over there and after that uh, there was a change in the legislation in from by, by the government and from then on they started rescuing these primates uh, from the streets so this is an example where uh, uh, this visual storytelling it's so compelling that 
change the story and the course of a country. So I think it's really, for us, is a complete victory. And the second image I want to present is, I'm sure that so many people around the world have seen this image. It's so compelling. It's by Justin Hoffman, and, and it shows um, a seahorse wrapped around a cotton bud. And it really put a spotlight on the conversation of plastic in the oceans and the pollution of the seas. So I, I really believe that there is an impact uh, of these images, and that's what we're trying to do with the wildlife talk of the year. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's amazing to see, Soraya. Thanks for that. Um, and I just, Brad, I know that you also recently worked with the UK Embassy in China on Wildlife Photography of the Year, but for a very different audience. Yeah, so so kind of similar, but, but kind of different. Um, this year, we wanted to do something for International Day of Biodiversity. And the winner of WPY 55 is Yong Cheng Bao. So we decided to reach out to the UK Embassy in China to do an online event to not just celebrate Yong Ching's achievement, but to have a conversation about biodiversity. So we worked with a ton of photographers to help promote the event. Uh, and then we invited Yong Ching and Britta Jaczynski, uh, who's been in the competition for many, many years, uh, and who takes an almost sort of documentary approach to recording wildlife crimes to join a panel with Chinese scientists and our own sort of museum's director of science. And ideally we wanted to reach a younger demographic um, and people who are not so connected to biodiversity themes. And it was kind of this insane, crazy success. So we reached over 4 million people through sort of the embassy's social media um, accounts and content. And then we reached 6 million people on this kind of live stream event. And uh, because we used a media platform called Billy Billy, it just reached this very young demographic, a demographic all across China. So a great way of kind of using those images to again, have a conversation about biodiversity. Thanks so much to both of you. It's just been great to talk about Wildlife Photography of the Year and kind of all the exciting things from the competition to the exhibition to kind of some of the other events we've been doing recently. So thanks both to you joining. Um, so I'm going to go back now um, to Paolo. We've got just a few minutes left. I think we're at the end of our session, but didn't know if there was any kind of questions that we wanted to go through at the very end. Just wait for Paolo to join us here. Um, we should yeah. also mention that we will be doing a meetup as well um, online for anyone who wants to continue the conversation Hello? with us will be available. And that's today at um, 1.45, isn't it, Paolo, just after this se next session? Here I am. Sorry. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for calling me back. Um, yes. Uh, so as you were saying, uh, uh, we now we can answer questions. But first, I just wanted to remind everybody that we can, of course, uh, uh, share with you all the material that we use during this session. Uh, we, um, you, we, we have actually organized a meetup at uh, 2.45 today, uh, Central Europe time. Uh, and so we will, be, we, we will be very happy to see you there. But otherwise, please just get in touch with us via email uh, and we will send you all the material we'll share with you today. So regarding the questions, we, uh, we received one uh, from Clara, which was regarding uh, the touchable objects and the digital interactives. Uh, in the face of COVID. And I uh, replied to this question saying that although these elements, of course, are part of the, uh, of the exhibition, uh, those are not the core, uh, uh, the only core elements of the exhibition. So there's uh, a lot more that can convey uh, this immersiveness. That, that is one of the, the main features of the exhibition. And then, of course, uh, depending on the country where the venue is and the local restrictions and guidelines, we will discuss with the single venues what is the best thing to do in terms of interactives and if to include them in the exhibition or not. And another and question, I, sorry, you, do you want to ask No, I think we're just running up on time, so maybe just the... Uh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, the only other question was about how uh, you add an online dimension to Walla Photograph of the Year exhibition. And uh, that was a question from Ingeborg. And I just said that at the moment we are producing a lot of new material to support our uh, partners and the venues that work with us. And, uh, and then we will be very happy to, to, to share some trailers about what we are doing with you um, at the meetup or in the coming days if you get in touch with us via email. I just want to say again, thanks to Excite, and we're excited to be here and hope to see you all soon um, in the next Excite in London or um, on the meetup.
Well, thanks to everyone. Thanks everyone. It was a real pleasure. Thanks so much for having us today.